Hi. Uh, sorry, I unfortunately don't speak French. Uh, I tried to learn it uh, this morning, but I failed. <laughs> so you're all going to have to deal with my New Yorker English accent. Um, cool. So I'm Brian Krauss. Um, I work at Stripe right now. Um, who here has not heard of what Stripe does? <laughs> I'm, I'm from San Francisco where everyone knows what Stripe does, so I'm, I'm spoiled. Um, basically, Stripe provides a payment API. We make it really, really simple to uh, collect payments online, um, get fast payouts, we have all of the cool little features, we have a RESTful API, um, and uh, we are kind of uh, the documentation people that everyone else copies. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a, fun, a fun position to be in. So I work on the API of Stripe. Um, I've been there about six months. Before that I was at Facebook. Uh, before that I had my own Y Combinator startup. So. Um, I love Facebook to join Stripe. They're an awesome team. I really, I really enjoy being there. Um, and I, I, like I said, I work on their API. So my talk is about uh, basically the patterns that I've seen at Stripe for uh, building APIs that uh, have really been uh, fairly effective, I like to think, uh, and kind of what we learned in the three to four years of, of releasing and, and modifying and growing our API. Um, props to Amber, my boss, who actually made these slides that I gratuitously stole. Um, so. Uh, so this is the Stripe documentation. Um, it's been a long evolution, but we have a lot of different pieces of functionality, a lot of different things that we can support, um, but it wasn't always like this. Uh, way, way, way back when, we basically had uh, a single API call. It was make a charge, uh, because when you're a payment company, that's kind of what you need to start with. Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through how Stripe built up its API uh, and kind of lessons learned then. So. Let's say you want to make an API. Uh, these examples are in Ruby, but it kind of applies to every language. Um, you have your, your, your basic functionality. You know, when someone hits uh, you know, a part of your API via you know, the website, you want to make a charge, and then you want to return them information about that charge. Pretty straightforward. Um, but as soon as you kind of start thinking about this a little more, you realize you need a bunch of other things. So you need validation. Uh, so you can kind of imagine, you know, before you actually run the card, you want to make sure it's a valid credit card number. You want to make sure it's a valid amount that's not a negative amount, so that no one's stealing money from you, and fun things like that. And then even before that, you want to make sure that the user has the right to actually use your API. So you want authentication. So you kind of have these three parts of the API, uh, and now we essentially have a working credit card charging API, barring all of the actual talking to credit card networks, which is another talk I won't get into. Um, but you can kind of you know, imagine trying to take this, this pattern of building all this and applying it to a lot of different places. Um, we have our basic API, but what, where do we go from there? So logically, you want to add more endpoints, more functionality. You want to allow yourself to change, to evolve the API. Uh, and this all leads to more problems, because as you get a larger and larger code base, uh, things get really messy. So you get a large tangled code base, you find yourself copying and pasting code everywhere, um, and it just, it just starts to become messy. So what has, uh, and you start to just have dependencies that conflict with each other, and it becomes messy. So, and then my favorite one is, you know, you have this complicated system, and you make a change to it, and then you don't update the docs, and now no one knows how to use your cool new feature. So um, these are all the problems that, you know, Stripe started running into, or at least imagined they would run into and, and preemptively uh, solved for. So what did we do? So when, when you're building an API or a product, I think everyone kind of naturally thinks about their user. They say, what does, what, what does my user want to do? What will make a good experience for my user? Um, what you really also have to do is, is think about what will make it good for you and what will make the API uh, pleasant for you to use. Because really, if it's... If it's easier for you to use, you're going to build it well, you're going to add features that you normally wouldn't have put the time in to add, um, and you'll just be a happier person in general. Um, uh, I've heard some friends describe this as the happy path or the pit of success. Uh, Paul Graham calls it the pit of success. I think. Um, basically, you kind of want you kind of want the patterns of your API to lead you into doing the right thing, um, both externally and internally. So the first thing that we did there is, is the obvious one that I won't spend much time on. <clears throat> Excuse me, which is separating layers of logic. So you know you have all you can you can kind of pull out different parts of an API: uh, authentication, making sure they have the right to access this first, validation, 
then your custom logic, then building consistent response types and error handling. Um, this is just separation of responsibilities. Um, I think you know, this, this comes up enough in software engineering talks that I, I won't go into it in more detail. Um, so you know, Stripe certainly built that, um, and I'll let you imagine what that actually became, what, what that actually looks like, but I'm sure you've seen similar things before. Um, the, things, the, the things I found interesting and kind of unique and worth talking about are um, make it hard to mess up. Make it so that, like I said, you fall in that pit of success and you know, your natural inclination is to do the right thing. So a good example being documentation. Um, so, you know, normally the way people tend to document things are they have their static website and that contains documentation and they have their API or whatever. Um, and when they update one, they need to remember to update the other. We didn't like this. So we basically inlined our documentation. So anytime, <clears throat> anytime you change the way a method works in our API, uh, right below it is where you would change the documentation. And we actually use this kind of API spec to generate our documentation to some extent. So we still have all of our custom logic, all of our custom kind of code. Um, but you know, at some point we'll say, okay, stick in all the parameters into our docs. Um, and it'll say, okay, well, amount is an integer, card number is a string, uh, and here's documentation around them. So I think that really helped a lot with kind of keeping things up to date and making sure nothing broke. Um, another thing that we did was hiding backwards compatibility. So um, one of uh, the things Stripe is, I, I think, hopefully loved for is that um, our API never basically breaks. Um, well, it breaks if we ship a bug, but it doesn't break for deprecated reasons. We don't, we don't stop old people's code from working um, unless we're pretty confident that we're not gonna break anyone. Um, so this is hard to do because, so you can imagine, let's say we wanted to remove the amount value from the, the API. Um, you can no longer specify an amount for your charge, you can only charge a dollar. Um, you can kind of imagine that, well, in the beginning, we check what version a user's on and then check what they're allowed to do. And in the end, we check what version they're on and check what response they should get. Um, this, is, this, is, this has two problems with it. So the first one is no one really knows what version one means. So you can't really just sequentially version everything um, because it just makes the code very hard to read and it makes it hard to understand uh, what's really, what, what is really going on without actually just searching your code base for version one and then kind of interpreting the code. So the way we solve that is with gates. So basically, every time someone makes an API call, um, we will, uh, if we, they haven't been pinned to a version before, we'll kind of pin them to the latest version. And each version defines some descriptive gates that says what kind of backwards compatibility features they have. Um, and the nice thing about this is this automatically generates our change log. So when you want to see what has changed from your version of Stripe to the latest version, we can just pull in these descriptions. Um, so now we can actually just check a gate on allows amount, um, which is a pretty, a much more intuitive thing than version one. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of a step up right there in that it's a little more descriptive of what it's doing. The second one is compatibility layers. So in the same way that we don't want our users to have to think about versioning, we don't want internally to have to worry about versioning. Um, so what we decided is we're just gonna pull out all of the versioning considerations into these two files, uh, request compatibility and response. So basically, when a request comes in, it goes to this layer that translates any old part of the incoming request into a new part. Um, and then similarly, when we send something out, we just uh, you know do this same thing but in reverse. So this allows us to actually, in our core API logic, to not really have to worry at all about um, you know, versioning. When we add a new version, we modify these two files, but otherwise it's not a day-to-day -day concern, which makes it a much more pleasant code base to deal in because you kind of avoid these uh, if statements everywhere, which you would have a fair number of. So that's kind of our compatibility. So that in the real world has actually uh, allowed Stripe to, to scale pretty well. So we have 106 different endpoints as of a month ago, um, 65 different API versions. We have six different API clients, so different languages. Um, and, uh, you know, I think things break fairly rarely. We have people still doing large production systems on fairly old, old versions. Um, so the parameters are named differently, their functionality is slightly different. Uh, and we managed to keep this, and, and I get asked a lot whether or not this is a huge pain point, and really it, it, it doesn't bother me on a day-to-day -day basis because I just don't run into it. Um, it I, it's only there when I, I need to work with it. So. 
just to summarize, uh, really you should design for yourself. You should try to kind of separate uh, things out logically, uh, pull your backwards compatibility out to kind of not have it bother you on a day-to-day -day basis, and just generally try to kind of force yourself down the happy path of uh, writing, you know, clean, reusable code. Um, generally, what else for Stripe? <clears throat> this is this has served us pretty well so far. Um, but you know, we're really not sure where this is taking us in the future. You know, I think uh, we have built an engineering organization where we move very quickly, and we've kind of enabled ourselves to change a lot on very short notice without you know breaking things. Um, but you know, as we scale from 175 people to 300, 400 people, um, we'll see. But I think the the nice thing is that we're always willing to kind of reconsider these and and change things around to try and allow us to move quickly. So. That's it, and I'll take any questions. Don't be shy, come. <laughs> we can answer the questions if you want. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, didn't you find cases where you couldn't convert an old version to a new one? Yeah, so the question is, did we find cases where we couldn't convert an old version to a new one? Um, yeah, we did. So there's kind of two ways we allow you to do compatibility in, inside of our code base. The first is you just take the raw response and then turn it into a new version. Usually when we're versioning the API, we're adding functionality, so you can do that translation. For the cases that you're talking about where you can't, you can also kind of access the rest of the code base and do, uh, you know, database accesses and kind of generate the response that you want. Um, we try not to because that's, you know, gets very spiderwebby Getty code, um, but we do have the ability for cases like that. So it's more costly, but you maintain it. Yeah, it's, it's more costly. I, I don't think we care from like a overhead CQ <coughs> perspective, but from a maintainability perspective, yeah. In one of the slides, you, you, sh you have shown the, the documentation with the code samples. And uh, how do you maintain those samples? Because uh, if uh, all the documentation is in the code, uh, do you have also in it uh, documentation for implementation in Java, in JavaScript, etc.? Or is it separate and maintain it uh, separately? So you're talking about uh, one of the first uh, one. Basically, my first slides. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. This one. So yeah, we have we have example code in kind of all of all of the languages that we support. Um, so the question is, how do we? Um, do we have those examples? Yes, we do. So we have some utilities in our documentation code that make it much easier to generate those examples. So we basically have like, you know, generate a curl example with these parameters. Um, those are fairly manually written. We could probably auto-generate a fair number of them, but it just, yeah, hasn't been too much of a problem yet. Okay. Thank you. You didn't mention anything about scale. Is that because uh, you didn't have any scaling problems with the API, or is it just because this was focused on code maintenance and uh, evolution good, conversions? Good question. So, so the question is, does Stripe have scaling problems? Um, so generally, compared to, let's say, like Facebook, my previous job, no, we don't, just because you know our API calls are around giving us money or giving someone money. Um, whereas, you know, so it's not like you're just loading a home page of something where it's getting hit a million times a second. Um, that being said, we do have scaling problems. They're most um, scaling challenges. They're mostly, you know, being available all the time because if we drop a single attempt to charge a credit card, that person's literally just lost some money. Like they could, like it's just very, very problematic. Um, so I think our focus tends to be more on reliability. Um, so I mean, we're we're built on AWS. We have a very good infrastructure team that you know kind of keeps all that alive for us. Um, I think I think the main the main challenge has always been kind of availability, um, and then also making sure when the, the holiday season rolls around, we have the, the extra capacity and, and know where our bottlenecks are to be able to handle the uh, the holiday rush. How many people would care of uh, infrastructure? How many people? I'm sorry. Work in the infrastructure team. So our, our sys team, our infrastructure team, is probably about a dozen people. Um, our product team is probably another 15, 20 engineers. Um, so overall, the company is 175 people. I'd say about 50 of that is our engineers. Um, we also have a fairly large risk and, and fraud and uh, machine learning team for fraud and uh, a pretty large data team. Did this way of coding with uh, separating of separation of concern, etc., help uh, a lot in, uh, in scalability in general? Or is it completely separate, separate matters? Um, 
separation of responsibilities in code for scaling kind of code maintainability yeah, yeah. or scaling like like scaling with a, a ton of people is it easier to uh, to scale services right in, in this way or does it, does it not have any uh, any incidence in a so in terms of practical kind of CPU scaling, yeah. it doesn't really mean much to us. In terms of kind of scaling the organization, I think it's vital. Um, so you know, being able being able to kind of separate responsibilities, um, I think I think has been really necessary as we've gone from you know one person owns something to multiple people own something, um, because you know as product grew from five people to ten to twenty. Um, I think I think the other added benefit there is as if you if you build your lines and separation of responsibilities well, you get a lot of very powerful features out of it. So you know I've had a, a fair number of conversations with uh, potential integrators asking, well, can we use this part of the API with this? And because we've kind of separated the responsibility and kind of put it in the right place in the code base, the answer is almost always yes. So you know, can I use payouts with uh, delayed transfer schedules as an arbitrary example? Like the, the, the answer, if you build your separation right, is usually yes. So that's the, the biggest benefit I've seen from, from kind of having a, a well a well organized code base. You said you got 65 different versions. So each time you release a new version, you deploy a new server. So maybe at the end of time you got million, then millions of servers. <laughs> so the question is, if we just deploy a new version, uh, do we launch a new server, and wouldn't we then have a million servers, let me go, cool. Uh, so this is a version. We don't deploy a new server for every version. Um, this is all running within a single code base. So we will kind of just push the new code to all of our API machines um, and they will all kind of do the routing. Um, so versions are done via either a lookup on the merchant saying this is the version that you're on or a header that they pass us asking what version to be on. So uh, we don't have to add new servers for every version we support so we can trivially just kind of put as many new versions in here. It's just extra kind of change log lines. I don't know if it's a very appropriate question, but you mentioned that you had a YC company. Mm -hmm. What happened to it? <laughs> so the question is, what happened to my YC company? Mm -hmm. So my company was Gaze Hot. We did eye tracking technology using webcams. Uh, we were part of the summer 2010 batch. Um, so we basically, uh, it was myself and my co-founder I knew from college, we raised half a million dollars in funding, hired you know, four people, so we were six at our largest, uh, tried to kind of prove out the product, prove out the model. We were unable to uh, do that kind of to the extent that we needed to raise a Series A of funding. Um, so we, uh, we were acquired by Facebook. There was a, a small talent acquisition, um, just kind of give liquidity to our investors. I'm happy to answer questions like that. Yeah. Stripe is awesome. Everyone should use Stripe, but I like Y Combinator too. <laughs> Why did you stay only six months uh, at Facebook? Uh, oh, I was at Facebook for two years. Two years. Um, okay. Yeah. So I I stayed for two years. I started. Um, so I was at Gaze Hawk, my startup. I was Stripe's ninth customer. So we were one of the early ones to integrate. Um, I think I was the first. Uh, I think I either wrote or heavily rewrote their original PHP. API, their bindings, um, just because we were in PHP. Uh, so it was, um, I honestly, I felt like I had more to learn at Stripe than I did at Facebook at that point. Um, I love both companies, but for me, Stripe was definitely the right place to be. Because it's in Ruby. Because it's in Ruby. <laughs> I, I did not know a single line of Ruby joining joining Stripe. Um, I, I PHP was my first language, which I will not defend as a glorious language. I personally <laughs> enjoy it because it's nostalgic for me. Um, but I, I try not to get into language holy wars. It, it's never fun. I propose you go debate uh, with her uh, if uh, PHP or Ruby is better within. Uh, I'm going to need a number of drink. drinks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.